Today's reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. The transfigured, uh, Transfiguration. And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Then Peter, uh, ta -ta -ta. if you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Oh. I'm sorry, where are you? And his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him what they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of, to them of John the Baptist. Here ends the reading. We have uh... We have news from NASA this week that new worlds have been discovered. If you've been uh, following this, it's uh, been kind of a, an interesting thing. Some 40 light years away, they've determined that uh, around a, a dwarf star, that there are seven Earth-like planets, exoplanets, since they're outside our solar system, that are in the habitable zone, as we understand that in our solar system and uh, three Earth-like planets, and it's a, a big ado, and if you uh, follow astronomy, that's an exciting thing. It's all in an effort to see if there are other worlds that might have water on them, and therefore might have life as we know it on the planet. So, uh, exciting stuff. Right here, we have a, another world revealed. That's what's happening on this day in the scriptures. Another world is being revealed to us. It's a world that is being revealed to us, I hope, in this service for you. It's a world that isn't new. It's a world that has always been. It's God's very presence. We think of it maybe as the kingdom of heaven, that which is beyond earth and yet in and uh, through earth as God is with us. Math Matthew's gospel reveals this other world. We call it the transfiguration of Jesus. And this is a, a high point in uh, Peter, James, and John's experience with Jesus. They get to see Moses and Elijah. And I always wonder, uh, this is one of those things where the kingdom of heaven is different than what we normally get on a day-to-day -day basis on earth because of course, Moses and Elijah lived centuries before Peter. There's no possible way that Peter could know who Moses and Elijah are. 
But in fact, it's Moses and Elijah who appear, and Peter knows it. That's God at work. <laughs> it says, in, depending on which uh, gospel account you read, that he doesn't really know what he's saying or he, not thinking he blurts this stuff out. But somehow, when God is present, anything can happen. And it's re in this is revealed who Jesus really is. Moses and Elijah, in Luke's account of this, they are discussing Jesus' plans to return to heaven. It talks about his departure from earth and his return to heaven. This is a way that we understand, as he's sharing it with us, who Jesus really is. The transfiguration happens just before Lent. And of course, Lent starts in this year, this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. It's when those 40 days, not counting Sundays before Easter, that we begin Jesus' journey to Jerusalem for the final time when he knows and he's been sharing that he needs to go down to be handed over to the authorities to be crucified and to be raised from the dead. He's been telling them this plainly. And we'll go through kind of the context of that coming up. It's, it's not a surprise that this mountaintop experience this breaking in of the heavenly realm into earth so that the disciples could see it and experience it happens just as Jesus is going down to suffer. It's as if he is being prepared. With the account of Moses and Elijah coming to share with him details about his departure back to heaven, they're strengthening him for what is to come. You shouldn't be surprised that something similar should happen in our lives, that as we go through ordeals and uh, times of trial, that God won't also prepare us and give us the strength to go through them. The context of this is interesting. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, and he's plainly told his disciples. It starts out before this. You have to read a bit before this comes up. The religious authorities are wanting Jesus to show them a sign. He says, show us a sign, then, then we'll believe. If you do something major, do a miracle, do something. And of course, he's been doing things all the time. But they, they want something. They, they want heaven to break in right in front of them so that they can get this, they say. And Jesus doesn't do that. He's been doing miracles, but he never does them to prove who he is. Now, he will point to him and say, since I'm doing these things, he uses this as a proof for John the Baptist to, to know who he really is. Since I've been doing all of these things, you should know <laughs> that it is me. You should know that God has stepped into humanity. But he never does it as a proof that he is who he is, for somebody's asking for it. Oftentimes he pulls people aside to heal them. He doesn't do it to, as a stunt to show his power. He doesn't do it as to gain fame or to get their favor or their blessing. He doesn't need that. He doesn't do it for those reasons. He doesn't profit from it. He doesn't even do them to prove he's divine, although he'll say, you know, only God can do that. They'll say that to themselves. He can't be doing this. Only God can do that. But they never make the connection. Oh, so then this must be God in the flesh. They never are willing at this point to take that leap of faith. He does say he will give them a sign, but the only one they get is the sign of Jonah, which is a reference to the prophet being in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. And he says the Son of Man is going to happen the same way. Reference to him being in the tomb for three days. Religi religious leaders aren't ready to get the sign, but that's all he gives them. But then, in private, with only Peter, James, and John, this most amazing sign happens. He doesn't do it for everybody else, but he does it. It happens there, and three of them get to see it. Jesus is transfigured. He's, his appearance changes and it's like lightning, and it's like nothing else, and it's uh, various accounts show that the disciples uh, somehow lose consciousness or are stunned and, uh, in the very presence of Jesus. And Moses and Elijah appear. Now, this is significant because 
For those that would be seeking the sign, this would be it in totality. This would be impressive because Moses is the giver of the law as the Jewish people talk about him. He is the one through whom the law came. This is God's word and it was chiseled in stone by the finger of God and later written down. It's, Moses represents God's law, the giving of all of God's ways to live. He's the word of God written form. And Elijah, of course, was one of the greatest prophets. God did amazing things through Elijah, miraculous things, consistently. Powerful man. Kings didn't like to see Elijah coming because he was always going to do something against them because they weren't behaving. But Elijah, even though he too had his shortcomings and his failings and his times where he thought he, he was no use anymore, he was a mighty man of God. He is, represents all the prophets, maybe the greatest prophet beside Moses. He is the spoken word of God, the word of God spoken by the Holy Spirit. So you've got the written word, the word in symbolized in written form in Moses, Elijah, the spoken word of God through the prophets, and Jesus is standing there, the Messiah, the chosen one, who even claims to be the word of God in the flesh. It doesn't get any better than that, except that the Holy Spirit also shows up. Then you get the Trinity present, such so all-encompassing. God the Son in the flesh is there, Jesus. God the Father speaks in that moment. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And of course, the Holy Spirit, present in what is described as the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, God's presence right there. There's been one time in my life where I've experienced that cloud. Uh, I've experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit here in this sanctuary, in this church, on multiple occasions. But the one, the one time I felt that cloud and that was at a David Wilkerson crusade. I've shared part of my story with you about that, having to go down front and dedicate my life to Christ. But when we got down close to the, the platform as I walked down that center aisle, it's as if I stepped into a um, cloud, maybe covers it, uh, I stepped into something. And it was almost, you could feel it. And colors within this, area of presence it was kind of around the front platform and i suppose it was you know 10 20 feet deep sort of as it you could walk down the center aisle and just like you stepped stepped into something and uh it was good and everybody that was in this cloud people are giving their life to christ and some of the kids are coming off drugs and uh david wilkerson was ministering to people and uh, Everybody in there was kind of walking around with a silly grin on their face. I think I was one of them. You just look around at people and it's like, ooh, hey, <laughs> you know, this, this is okay. You know, there's something here. You can kind of feel it. And it, it was uh, kind of pink amber color. I didn't see that color walking up to it, but when I stepped in, it was like, okay, we're in something different. There was a palpable, there was a, uh, you could feel it. Um, and I don't remember stepping out of it. I don't remember when I didn't feel it anymore. But you can just tell everybody kind of wandering around in there was feeling the same thing. Haven't had that same sensation since. There have been other manifestations. There was one time in the uh, prayer meeting in another church, uh, several of us heard the wind of God. And it was, I think, the Holy Spirit was blessing with us with as much of his presence as we could handle at the time. So we got a little wind. The church wasn't shaking and it wasn't a rushing violent wind, but there was a, the sound of a wind. And it was kind of towards the ceiling. And I remember being aware of it and thinking, you know, the furnace must have just kicked on <laughs> or something, you know. Like it was um, like a, almost like that, but as we were talking afterwards, did anybody else hear that? And the two, three of us 
had heard the same thing, and then we got to checking, well, that's not how the furnace works in this building. You know, it isn't that. And it's, oh, not everybody heard of it, two or three of us did, and it was different uh, than normal. It was, but it was there, and it was, uh, the Holy Spirit was blessing us with just a manifestation of his presence. There have been, the Holy Spirit has manifested in different ways, but only once did I sense that Shekinah glory, that glory of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit out of which the Heavenly Father spoke. It's very real. God is breaking into, in different ways, to let us know that what we just see on earth isn't all that there is. It's easy to get caught up in day-to-day -day things, and they're necessary, and they're good, and there's more. God breaks in. God finds a way. Breaking in may be a little bit too harsh, but we, we talk about God stepping into, invading, or in ways that we can handle, just nudging us, just letting us know in our heart that this is different, this is new, this is not the same. There's more. God is doing that. God can do that for you. We don't seek the experiences, but we seek God. We seek Jesus. We seek to draw closer to him. This season of Lent is a great time to do that. It's a, a season that the church has set aside as preparation for Easter. As Jesus faces Jerusalem and goes through all of these things, we get to journey with him. So during this time, this season, uh, take the time. Do what it takes to open your life to him, to follow the journey, read it in the scriptures, do the devotional book. Uh, if you want to come to the study, that would be a great way to do it too. Ash Wednesday service is a great way to begin. But be aware of this other realm, this other world. NASA's just found other worlds, <laughs> but the kingdom of heaven is yet a different realm, world, that is very real to us. The purpose, the purpose for you in this life is something that God will prepare you to face. God will never lead you where God hasn't prepared you. It could happen at any time. I was at Barnes and Nobles last night, uh, and we were, uh, Susan and I were just kind of walking through. I got what I needed to get, and as Susan saw Bill O'Reilly's book, children's books, in there. Oh, we've heard about this. You know, there's, there's we're flipping through that, and. And uh, some guy says, oh, you, you like that Bill O'Reilly book. I said, well, we haven't seen it. And he says, you like Bill O'Reilly? No, I try to stay away from him. And uh, so we got on this conversation. Yeah, he's always, is he killing kids? Because uh, he's always, you know, killing Patton and killing Lincoln and killing Jesus. And they said, well, I've read, I've read some of those books, and the Killing Jesus book actually was pretty good. Oh, really? Well, who killed Jesus? So I said, well, we, we did because of all of our sins. Oh, who did he say killed him? And I said, well, that's part of it. Uh, all of us, because of our sinning, killed Jesus. And then we went on to talk about uh, authorities, and he was a real quick thinker guy, and so the conversation was all over the place, but it was interesting. And then we talked about other books that uh, we're reading, and then he talked about other discoveries, and then we talked about more about faith, and a little bit about this NASA discovery and some things. Uh, right there in Barnes & Noble, uh, the Lord chose to let us witness to a man who likes to think about things. And I told him, you know, that is okay. Because then Susan said, well, my husband's a pastor. And he was like, and fortunately, that didn't ruin the conversation. Because, uh, you know, when that happens, it's like, ooh, okay, just back away. <laughs> Don't upset the nice man, you know. 
but oh, well, then you know about these things. And I said, well, it's, I picked up some things. And so we had a discussion then about uh, astronomy and different things. And, and I said, you know, it's okay for you to question things, to think about things, to want to know how this works. All of that's okay. And I think he was surprised maybe to hear that. But we talked a little bit about astronomy and, um, and just how God is at work in that process. Well, that's a trivial example, but it could happen anywhere where there's an opening for you just to share about Jesus. And there may be, you're going to be going through some difficult times. Maybe you're going through difficult times right now. The beauty is, as Moses and Elijah came down to share God's plan about how the events are going to unfold for Jesus, that same kind of thing is available to you. God is present for you to prepare you, to share with you heaven's plan, to surround you with a community of people that will help you in it and through it, to give you maybe even palpable signs of his presence, maybe even very real, like now I know that's not normal, kinds of breaking in of heaven in your life so that you can make it through the difficult times, the hard times that come to all of us from time to time. God is so good. He knows how to help you as an individual. He knows your heart. He knows what you're going through. He knows how you are finding that difficult and how to help you through it. God is so good. He loves you so much. He yearns to make himself real to you. Make yourself available to him. You need it. We all need it. We all need each other. And God is ready and willing to be in it with you. Let's pray together. Lord, you are amazing. Help us to trust you. I pray that you will work within each one of us, maybe even in this time leading up to Easter. But even if it weren't the season of Lent, a, a time to... Keep us focused. We pray that you will, by your Holy Spirit, keep us focused on you. I pray that you will break into our lives, that you will enter into our world, so to speak. Reveal yourself to us in just the ways you know how for each one of us individually that we can know to the very core of our being that you are with us, that you're in the midst of this life with us. Because we need you, Lord, to do this right. Be with us in our, our various circumstances, our various situations in life. Bring healing. Break chains of bondage of all kinds. Free us to live as people of light and life in all of our relationships, all of our dealings. Can't really do it without you, Lord. Keep working with us. Make us more than we could ever imagine by your grace and by your power and your mercy. You're our all in all. You're our everything. We trust you. We rely on you. Make yourself known to us in new ways. 
tangible ways, we pray. In your precious name, Jesus, the risen, present, living Lord. Amen. You stand for the closing, please. When you leave this place, the very presence of God goes with you. There isn't any place you can go where you can escape God's presence. There isn't any behavior that keeps God from reaching in and touching you. So trust him with your life. Walk with him. Serve him. Fellowship with him. Live life in the hands of the giver of life. Give him your all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.